Hello, hello, and thank you for being here. My name is Camila Marshall. I am a performer who's had the opportunity to perform here, there, and everywhere. But some of my most favorite memories was performing at Musical Theater West in Little Shop of Horrors and Hairspray. And yes, if you are wondering, that is a Christmas tree in the background because I refuse to give up Christmas. Welcome to Celebrate Black Broadway Artists. Every Friday for the month of February, my mother, Stevie Meredith, is going to take you on a 30-minute ride through the history of Black musicals and Black artists. This week in our third course, we're going to take a look at when Black was kind of in vogue with Pearl Bailey and Cab Calloway in the all-Black production of Hello, Dolly, to the Motown-produced Guys and Dolls, Your Arms Too Short to Box with God, and the all-famous The Wiz. And now, here's my mom. Stevie. Good evening and thank you Milo for that sweet introduction. We'll talk about the Christmas tree later. And thank you Musical Theater West for your celebration of Black History Month. I would be remiss if I did not thank Paul Garman, the king of Musical Theater West, but also a thank you to Bren Thor, Michael Betts, and the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Committee. Thank you all. Well, last week we had quite the discussion. Our highlight of Showboat and Porgy and Best really sparked some comments, some great comments in the chat. And we wanna hear from you this week too. We subtitled this week, When Black Was in Vogue. And these five shows tonight have all been on my favorites list at one time or another. So let's get started. Hello, Dolly, premiered on Broadway in 1964, featuring lyric and music by Jerry Herman, a book by Michael Stewart, and choreography by Gower Champion, who won the Tony Award for Best Choreography. The Broadway blockbuster hit was based on the play The Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder, and boasted classic tunes like Before the Parade Passes By, Put On Your Sunday Clothes, It Only Takes a Moment, and the irresistible Hello Dolly. In 1968, an amazing performance, performance graced the Tony Awards. Carol Channing took the stage to announce a show that she had made famous, as well as the talented Miss Pearl Bailey. You think about it now, an African-American revival of Hello, Dolly! with a Black Dolly Levi wouldn't be so shocking. But in 1968, it was a huge surprise. When you think of Hello, Dolly!, you probably think of Carol Channing or Barbara Streisand, not a Black woman. This is one of the reasons that performance was one of the most epic Tony Award performances ever. Pearl Bailey didn't miss a moment to have someone who originated the role announce and pass the torch was amazing. And the cast tore up that Tony stage. The voices, the choreography, and the acting, all stellar. Remember now, 1968 was a time of war and protest, racism and hate to take a white show and add an all black cast was risky business. And for Jerry Herman to do it in the middle of a run, even riskier. After touring with Cab Calloway, starring opposite Miss Bailey, David Merrick decided to take the wildly popular show to Broadway, where it played to sold out audiences and revitalized the long running musical. The all black version of the show breathed new life into an already long-running production. Pearlie May was ineligible to be nominated for a Tony that year for Best Actress in a Musical Revival because she was a replacement. Now, I bet you nobody knows who she replaced. Any guesses? Betty Grable. That was a new fun fact I found. But right after that performance on the award show, Jack Benny presented her with a special Tony Award, making it clear that she would have won. And the entire cast was able to record its own recording, 
which was an unusual then and now for a revival cast to record a, an original recording. Among Pearl Bailey's other Broadway appearances were St. Louis Woman in 1946, Arms and the Girl in 1950, and House of Flowers in 1954. The original production of Hello, Dolly closed in 1970, but Bailey came back to Broadway in her role for a new revival that was created expressly for her in 1975, this time starring recording artist Billy Daniels opposite. And if you don't know Billy Daniels or Cab Calloway, please look them up. You won't be disappointed. It should be noted that late in her life, Carol Channing wrote in her autobiography that her father was black. So technically, I guess that makes Carol Channing the first black dolly. This one is one of my favorites. I'm gonna say that about everyone, so get ready. Your arms too short to box with God. A soaring celebration in song and dance is a Broadway musical based on the biblical book of Matthew with music and lyrics by Alex Bradford and a book by Vinette Carroll, who also directed. Produced by Frankie Hewitt and the Schubert Organization, it opened December 22nd, 1976 at Broadway's Lyceum Theater in New York City. It moved to the Eugene O'Neill Theater on November 16th, 1977 and finally closed on January 1st, 1978, after 429 performances. The phrase, your arms too short to box with God, first appeared in James Weldon Johnson's novel, The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, which he attributed to a preacher named John Brown. Descri describing this powerful preacher, he wrote, he struck the attitude of a pugilist and thundered out, young man, your arms too short to box with God. Later, Johnson used it in his poem, The Prodigal Son, which was published in the 1927 book of poems, God's Trombones, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. The passage reads, young man, young man, your arms too short to box with God. The title phrase has also been used in other contexts, including songs by Eric B. and Rakim, the Wu-Tang Clan, Nas, and Big Daddy Kane. You didn't know I could get down with the rappers like that, did you? Dolores Hall won the 1977 Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. Carol earned Tony nominations for Best Book of a Musical and Best Direction of a Musical, with Tally Beatty nomi nominated for Best Choreography. Over uh, the time that it played, the show also hosted celebrity singers, including Al Green and Patti LaBelle. I have to say that I selected this show because of Ms. Carroll. Vinette Justine Carroll was an American playwright, actress, and theater director. She was the first African-American woman to direct on Broadway with her 1972 production of the musical, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And until Liesl Tommy's 2016 nomination for Eclipsed, Carol was the only African-American woman to have received a Tony Award nomination for directing. Many years ago, I became interested in directing. I was at Inner City Cultural Center in Los Angeles. I remember the old Masonic Temple building at Pico in New Hampshire like it was yesterday. Vinette came to the inner city to work on a piece titled, When Hell Freezes Over, I'll Skate. The large theater at inner city had a balcony, so I used to go up there and watch Miss Carol direct. I listened intently to every word she said. I watched as she moved the actors around and one evening, when I was quietly observing, she thundered, you might as well come down and sit with me. 
Well, I did go sit with her almost every night until the project was finished. I learned a lot. And as I got my first directing jobs, I was able to call her and speak to her about my directing dilemmas. She was so generous and so warm. And I'll always remember that special time at Inner City. Okay, this one's my favorite. I told you. The all black revival of Guys and Dolls also known as Motown's Guys and Dolls, opened at the Broadway Theater July 21st, 1976. Based on a story and characters by Damon Runyon, Guys and Dolls, the musical features music and lyrics by Frank Lesser and book by Joe Sperling and Abe Burroughs. The revival starred Robert Guillaume as Nathan Detroit, Norma Donaldson as Miss Adelaide, Ernestine Jackson as Sarah Brown, and James Randolph as Sky Masterson, with Kim Page as Nicely Nicely Johnson. I know you can hear sit down you're rocking the boat right now. In the New York Times article titled Guys and Dolls Comes Back Black, writer Judy Clamerud interviewed Billy Wilson, the director and choreography of a new black version of Guys and Dolls. Reclined in his chaise in, in his Riverside Drive apartment, Billy tried to explain how he went about transforming the 26 year old Frank Lesser musical with a strongly Jewish flavor into a black show that the, he thinks is updated, soulful, hip, it was like taking chicken soup, he said, with a slow smile crossing his face and making it a little more combo. More specifically, the show about small time Broadway gamblers, their dames, their dreams and their troubles ran for 1,200 performances after it opened on Broadway on November 20th, 1950. Longer than any references to cheesecake and strudel. In the black version, the characters eat famous apple pie and strawberry shortcake instead. But these weren't the only changes. Billy Wilson sought to change the rhythm of speaking and he interjected phrases that were particular to the black experience. Wilson didn't just wanna change a word here and there, he wanted to add the rich attitudes that were intrinsic to the black community. You see, it's not always what you say, it's how you say it. All the changes in the script had to be approved by Abe Burroughs who wrote the original book along with the late Joe Swirling. Burroughs supervised the new production and sat in on most of the rehearsals. Also, they were very rigid with the music. Frank Lesser had to pass, had passed, so his widow felt she needed to stay true to what he would have wanted. But people who knew Frank thought he would have loved it. So enter the production featuring Motown arrangements by Danny Holgate and Horace Ott and choral arrangements by Howard Roberts. The music was in a different pocket, as they say. Motown's Guys and Dolls played 12 previews and 239 performances before closing February 13, 1977, earning three Tony Award nominations, including Most Innovative Production of a Revival. I don't know if they still have that award. In the Times interview with Billy Wilson, he said, I'm quietly angry that because I've gathered up all of these years and look back at them, and I see I've accomplished so much, yet it's still impossible for me to come out of the theater and get a taxi cab because taxi cabs will not pick up black people, especially black men. I've had to ask people to stand on Park Avenue to get me a taxi at night to take me to my hotel. It's really too much at times having to deal with the pressures of the arts and then being black and then the taxi cab thing on top of it. If you haven't listened to the Motown's Guys and Dolls, you can probably get the recording at um, on YouTube 
and do yourself a favor and hear those fantastic arrangements and Ken Page singing, sit down, you're rocking the boat. Okay, this one's my favorite. The Tap Dance Kid. The Tap Dance Kid is a musical based on the novel Nobody's Family is Going to Change by Louis Fitzhugh. The libretto was by Charles Blackwell, the lyrics by Robert Lorick, and music by Henry Krieger. You're going to remember that name, Henry Krieger. Just think about it for a second. The Tap Dance Kid opened on Broadway on December 21st, 1983 at the Broadhurst Theater. On March 11, 1984, it moved from the Broadhurst to the Minskoff and continued its run of 669 performances. The cast featured Hinton Battle, Hattie Winston, and Samuel E. Wright. For some of you youngins, Sam Wright voiced the role of Sebastian in Disney's Little Mermaid and originated the role of Mufasa in The Lion King on Broadway. Finally, the title role was played by 10-year-old Alfonso Ribeiro. And in 1984, Ribeiro's 10-year-old understudy was Savion Glover. The story is about the 10-year-old Willie from an upper-class Black family and his dreams of being a dancer. His father was against the idea. The entire second act is devoted to Willie's imaginings of stardom. The reviews were mixed. Frank Rich, reviewing for the New York Times, praised the choreography and many of the performance, but thought the plot was plotting and the musical forgettable. The Tap Dance Kid was nominated for seven Tony Awards. Danny Daniels took home the Tony for Best Choreography and the prize for Best Performance by a Featured Actor in a Musical went to Hinton Battle, making him the first African-American to win two Tony Awards. Okay, let's do it. Let's see that Tony performance. Four Broadway musicals have been nominated for the 1984 Tony Award. Tonight, you will see them all. The first is the Tap Dance Kid. Fabulous Seats, the Tap Dance Kid. Show us your fabulous seats.
Wow, there you go. Carlton was tapping, tapping. Truthfully, there isn't one song that I can sing from the show. But man, I do remember that dancing. There's something about seeing a big gaggle of people on stage tapping that just makes me happy. That production number on the Tony Awards had me dancing in my living room. Hinton Battle performed so many tap variations that the sound of his feet became a percussion symphony. He is also a master of breathtaking kicks and delicate ballet leaps. You can't record dance, not even on film, Battle said early on in his career. And once we watch his arms and legs in full blur, we believe him. As a side note, um, I'm proud to say that the U.S. Postal Service has a stamp out or coming out soon honoring tap dance. Okay, this one's really my favorite, The Wiz. In 1972, a New York City DJ, Ken Harper, was inspired by the dominance of the Motown sound and imagined a take on Frank L. Baum's novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. In an epic fantasy that distilled the tale through black lens, originally titled The Wiz, the Super Soul Musical Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Now y'all know that was too long, right? With words and music by Charlie Smalls and a few others, and a book by William F. Brown, The Wiz had an unparalleled production team. Producer Ken Harper replaced the original director, Gilbert Moses, with Jeffrey Holder. And as the Detroit out-of-town tryouts, Faison, uh, Don, George Faison did the choreography. Jeffrey Holder was on costumes. Harold Wheeler was charged with the orchestrations. Likewise, the cast was stellar. Armed with a formidable 15-year-old R&B diva, Stephanie Mills starred as Dorothy. Andre DeShields as The Wiz, Ted Ross, Hinton Battle, and Tiger Haynes as the Lion, Scarecrow, and Tin Man. Even with all of that, the show had such a rocky start that Harper considered closing it. In a 1993 interview, Labrettus Brown offered 20th Century Fox, the musical's major investor, put in another $100,000 to keep it going, and everyone agreed to royalty cuts until the production's cost, about $1.1 million, was, recruit, was recouped. By the eighth week, we were selling out. After weathering a ballooning budget, mixed reviews, technical hiccups, sluggish ticket sales, and constant threat of closure, the Wiz went on to win seven out of eight Tony Awards they were nominated for, including Best Musical. It was an early example of Broadway's mainstream acceptance of the works of an all-Black cast and a testament to the perseverance of the Black American dream in spite of mighty odds. Everyone remembers their first experience with The Wiz, whether it was the original Broadway production a tour that came to their town, the film starring Diana Ross, or just a high school musical production. The Wiz captured the social and cultural consciousness, consciousness of a post-civil rights existence. Foremost, The Wiz is a story of racial liberation, as well as an early piece of Afro, Afrofuturism in combination with fantasy and magic realism in the ancient African tradition. But the thing that defined its cult status is the movement and the music. George Faison's moment, movement was straight from the African diaspora, ballet, jazz, and modern movement that have defined black dance. The Emerald City sequence has informed everything from the black queer ballroom scene to the opening horns of Beyonce's Coachella performance. I mentioned earlier that there were a few others that created the music for the show. Timothy Grapen Reed and Harold Wheeler did Tornado and George Faison and Grapen Reed did the Emerald City Ballet. The music has shaped R&B for decades. It launched the powerhouse that is Stephanie Mills into R&B stardom, her show-stopping ballad home was played on the radio and cemented the lasting legacy of the Wiz. But a more potent flourish 
of the musical's greatness shines through the jubilant, everybody rejoice. Luther Vandross' pen song came from the heroine after she's killed the witch, freed the Winkies, and saved her, saved her new pals. Dorothy's journey home from the land of Oz suddenly becomes synonymous with slavery and the great mi migration, a spirited celebration of freedom songs from the whiz always meant more to black people. Ease on down the road. Don't nobody bring me no bad news. You can't win from the film and everybody rejoice. These songs feel more like a rallying cry from the tradition of gospel. Hello world, it's like a different way of living now. Thank you world, we always knew that we'd be free somehow in harmony and show the world that we've got liberty. It's such a change for us to live so independently. Freedom you see has got our hearts singing so joyfully. Just look about, you owe it to yourself to check it out. Can't you feel a brand new day? Do we have any questions or comments? I'm excited to see what's going on over there in the chat. Michael, come in and talk to me about Tap Dance Kid. Oh my gosh, you know, Stevie, Tap Dance Kid is my one of my, like you said tonight, I'm gonna say they're all my favorites. I love um, it. I yeah, I, I don't know where to begin. Well, let's begin with Motown Skies and Dolls. I mean, ha please put in the chat any questions, but like, have you heard the Motown Guys and Dolls? Have you heard Sarah Brown sing If I Were a Bell the way every Sarah Brown should sing it? The first time I heard it, it was a revelation because it's what every Sarah Brown should sound like. She has a great soprano, but then she drops it and does this fierce sort of abandoned, belty, screamy, I mean, it is every. I see in the chat, Olivia is asking, Stevie, would you consider playing Dolly? You would be amazing. And she gives me three hearts. Well, that is so sweet of you. I think my Dolly would be interesting. I have a few ideas for that. I want to see um, you coming down the staircase. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work. That's the part I probably would be nervous about too. <laughs> Somebody says, um, the Wiz is iconic. Absolutely. And one my, of my yeah. former students, Carly Menken, says, love this. Thanks for educating me once again, Stevie. I love that. So do we have any more? Uh, Mike Haber, in the Wiz, Mabel King portrayal of Eveline, the Wicked Witch of the West, is so powerful. The way she would belt and have to scream every night eight times a week. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure she had some vocals issues, but she she powered through it every night. Here's another one. Jesse Needham says, Stevie, other than the live TV version, I haven't seen the Wiz put on much recently. What do you think? would make theater companies more inclined to produce it. I think it's probably a, a little pricey depending on what your budget is. I mean, they're, the costumes alone, you know, you'd have to get really clever to do those. And having gone through it um, a couple of years ago, there are some references that would probably have to be changed. I'm sure some people probably feel like it's a little bit dated but it's such a great show. It's energetic. It's impossible not to love it if you're sitting there. I know when I first saw it, the yellow brick road was like too much for me. I was like, oh my goodness, this is the best idea yet. Um, of the, course, uh, Des, go ahead. Des McEnough at La Jolla Playhouse a few years ago, uh, there was a pre-Broadway revival of it. And then I never heard of it again after it closed. And what you said, it's a little bit about economics, Jesse. The, for, for a lot of regional theaters, we rely on an existing set and costume package. And there's not really an existing set or costume package for The Wiz. And I'm hoping someone builds it really soon because I... Oh, I did this show at Los Alamitos High School and broke the bank on the budget. 
I just, I felt like I, sh I deserved to have everything I wanted and I asked for everything and graciously they gave it to me, but it was, it was a lot pricier than, than what they usually put into a normal high school musical. But I had to have those yellow afros because got to have them. You know what? You guys are so great and I love all the comments. I can't wait to, to finish reading them. And thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. It was so much fun. I told you, these are the fun shows, the fun shows. But we have one more week, so be sure to come back. Michael, tell us all about the rest of Black History Week. Mom. Fantastic. We have icons of the day. If you're not looking at our icons of the day, go on to musical.org uh, forward slash celebrate. I'm going to try to type and talk at the same time, which is always dangerous for me. Uh, yeah. We have a dance class tomorrow. Uh, Tyrick Jones is teaching, we can't wait, is teaching Michael Peters in the style of Michael Peters. Who knows who Michael Peters is? I do, I do. Yay, Stevie. Uh, Michael Peters won, uh, shared a Tony Award with Michael Bennett for his choreography for Dreamgirls, uh, but also did Michael Jackson's Thriller. And I guarantee if you're a theater person, if you're an early 80s uh, baby, you know Michael Peters' work. Uh, so you should join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. It's an all skate, all levels. Uh, I've had a terrific time and I'm terrible, y'all, but I've had the best time at our dance classes. Uh, it is pay what you can, so please come. Uh, go again to musical.org forward slash celebrate. We've got another week with Stevie. We got Gra Grace Ann Kingsbury a week from tomorrow teaching uh, from The Wiz, teaching in the style of George Faison. We're celebrating him and doing something from The Wiz. Um, Stevie Meredith, Again, thank you for being here and sharing your joy and love for musical theater. It's just, it's heaven to have you. And I hope everybody at home is having uh, as much fun as we are. Uh, last words on some of the shows that we did today. Actually, no, I'm gonna put a gun to your head. What's your real favorite? What's my real favorite? Mm -hmm. If every show was your favorite show tonight, I'm gonna make you, give you a Sophie's okay. choice. I did tonight. My real favorite is Motown Skies and Dolls. I love it. I love it. And like Stevie said, if it can be hard to find. If you love a show already, and then you get to see the black version of the show, it's like heaven. And Stevie said it can be hard to find y'all, but YouTube. The cast album is usually, you can usually find the cast album on YouTube. Go to Amazon and buy it. There's an occasional copy. It is absolutely worth having in your collection. So with that, Miss Meredith, I think we're done for the evening. We'll see you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Stevie. <laughs>